Vikes now. I am Dustin Baker. It is a glorious victory Monday. The Vikings climb to five and four after starting the season 0 and three. Almost unbelievable considering all the circumstances. No Justin Jefferson for the last four games. Uh, Kirko Chains now out for the rest of the way. We've known that what for eight days now. But against all odds, these Vikings are five and four in the driver's seat for playoff positioning because. Uh, they beat the Falcons, who were 4-4. Four and four. They beat the Packers, who could get a little frisky if they get their shit together. And then the Saints, who are division-leading all of a sudden 5-4 and four up next, which will be another must-win game if they want to start to solidify a postseason berth. But with all of the uncertainty, especially after 1-4 and four, dropping to the Chiefs, Justin Jefferson hitting IR, uh, I'm here to tell you why this, this new brand of Vikings is for real. I got a list of about six, seven things that we're going to get into. And the first one is a common theme of this show and any Vikings media that you would have consumed in the last, what, uh, two months is finally the turnover differential, the turnovers, the, you know, the giveaways, the damn fumbles, and then the wherewithal by the defense to create turnovers that has com been completely fixed. Now, Josh Dobbs fumbled and took a safety in his maiden voyage game against the Vikings yesterday. But what do you, what do you expect? from a journeyman backup quarterback taking four days to learn the offense, there's going to be some shit that happens that makes you roll your eyes. And that indeed occurred at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. But the difference was the Vikings also forced turnovers. So back when Minnesota was, let's see, I think it was one in four against the, yeah, right after they lost the Chiefs, they had a negative nine turnover differential. And I said on this show, I'm sure you were telling your pals that if they just fixed this turnover problem, Things would be okay. And that sounded like a homer take at the time because, you know, of course they're good. They just need to stop the turnovers. But it was true. Since that Chiefs game, the Vikings have a plus four turnover differential. And boom, you know, they started winning. They've won, gosh, what is it? One in four in a row now without Justin Jefferson. So as, no matter what team it is, if you don't have positivity or you were that upside down in the turnover differential, bad things are going to happen. And that is what undid was beset on the Vikings through those first five games was there were too many, too many turnovers and they were so deadly because they happened right in the first quarter, which totally stunted momentum. Alas, they have got a handle on this turnover thing. Uh, the fumbles are still there every now and then, but they really don't matter so long as the Brian Flores the defense is forcing them on its own. For the first month, it was just the Vikings coughing the ball up or Kirk throwing stupid picks. And if your defense doesn't do anything to help you out and get those back, yeah, you're going to have a losing record. And that's precisely what happened. Meanwhile, another testament uh, to the Flores defense is through the first three games. So remember how heartbroken you were after the bungled final possession against the Chargers in week three where they, they rushed and tried to do a, you know, like a walk-off and leave only a matter of seconds. Hawkinson bungled the pass and Chargers won. Through that game, the Vikings ranked 26th per EPA per play, which is an efficiency metric that adjudicates all NFL teams. Since then, they didn't update it yet this morning. I'm going to assume that it's about the same. So 26th in the first three games, but since then, from the Carolina game, to yesterday's game, the Vikings rank about 7th per EPA per play. So their defense went from not good, also known as about 7th worst in the league, to about 7th best. Uh, I'll check to see what it is after it updates and the website is available after this game. But the defense has suddenly gotten not horrible and, in fact, in many moments is pretty good. Uh, we kind of knew that would happen with a defense, a uh, new defensive coordinator. It's going to take a while to gel. And that's exactly what it did. Uh, everything that you you were worried about, like, are there going to be growing pains? Yep. Is, is Brian Flores going to figure it out? Yep. That's what happened. And then, you know, when that, when that type of productivity from the defense starts to accompany an offense that's usually pretty productive, sans turnovers, you've got a good football team. So the turnover differential for sure, probably the number of the smoking gun reason as to why these Vikings have turned it around to the tune of a 5-4 and four record. But then along the way, the defense suddenly got quite good, not just unshitty anymore. They got pretty good, and it hopefully continues to be so. Meanwhile, there was a lot of heat and criticism aimed at Kevin O'Connell after the Chargers loss because of his decision, which he even regretted, to not spike the ball against the Chargers, not to take your time a little bit. 
They, they, they gunned it and tried to walk off the Chargers or only leave a few seconds left, and that didn't work. Now, if Hawkinson hauled that pass in, Kevin O'Connell would be a genius. However, because of the rotten start, there was a lot of sour sentiment from fans that said, well, maybe this head coach isn't that good after all. Last year, we were so lucky in 13-4 record, and Quazy doesn't know how to draft at all. There was a lot of downtrodden bullshit about the Vikings may have not selected the best guys to lead the team. Well, that was false. I, For the life of me, I will never understand how after a draft class, so for instance, the Vikings 2022 draft, draft class with Scene, Booth, Caleb Evans, Ty Chandler, Ed Ingram, I will never, ever understand why fans or self-ascribed pundits will write a draft class off after a single season. That is not how it works. You need multiple years to figure out if these picks are going to pan out and usually till the end of their rookie contract to get a full you know, grasp of are these guys any good. Oh, of course, it's depressing that Lewis Seen doesn't really play or that Booth is gradually getting acclimated to the defense. But this is how it works sometimes, especially for a GM in his first draft. And then all of a sudden, all of the, the subtle criticisms against Kevin O'Connell when the team was losing – they look stupid now. The guy looks brilliant. He's able to pull off wins, or at least one on the road against the Falcons without Kirk Cousins, with a quarterback who just showed up in Egan five days before. So I, I, I think all of the panic, uh, all you know, the honeymoon was over for Kevin O'Connell. I don't think that was fair. I think the Vikings made a wonderful hire with both the general manager and the head coach. And especially in the last month, you're seeing it in the flesh with the coach. Uh, I mean, in an offense first league, you have a former quarterback who's young, who's pretty aggressive, who's eternally optimistic, and has turned this season around against all odds when the best player in Justin Jefferson is out. By the way, you lose your franchise quarterback. Oh, cool. We're not going to have Christian Derrissaw the following game. Do you care that Marcus Davenport goes on IR? All of these factors mind-bogglingly don't seem to matter. The Vikings keep winning in spite of all of these doldrums, all of these mishaps of injuries and whatnot. So a tip of the cap to Kevin O'Connell and the you know the trade that was pulled off by Quasi Dafa Minza for Josh Dobbs. I think that this turnaround is a reaffirmation to some, including me, that the Vikings really got those hires right and the last month especially shows that Kevin O'Connell is built for this. Where in contrast, if you look at some of the other shit going on in the NFL, Brian Dable won Coach of the Year last year. It looks ridiculous. Uh, the Giants, I know that they just lost Daniel Jones before they even lost him. They look horrible. They look buffoonish. And so, you know, the league can change rather fast. And I'll always think it was a crime that Kevin O'Connell didn't get more Coach of the Year attention last year. But people didn't buy into the, the upside-down point differential or all the close wins. It was kind of weird. The next thing, why these Vikings are for real, is because Jordan Addison is for real. I think we've seen enough sample size, particularly including the San Francisco 49ers Monday night game, that this man has arrived. He's no longer just good a good rookie receiver. He's a good wide receiver, period. And with Justin Jefferson out for that month, hopefully Jefferson's back on Sunday, Addison filled in, did the trick. Um, there were some games against 49ers where he was – paramount he was essential for the win and then yesterday down the stretch Josh Dobbs is trying to engineer a, a clutch game winning drive and Addison hauls in that pass that looked very unlikely or that most wide receivers couldn't haul in so why this brand of Vikings is for real is a large can be largely attributed to Jordan Addison's really quick rise to stardom if he was just a Quentin Johnson or just some you know guy who wasn't really doing much, it would be really hard for the Vikings to be where they're at, especially because of Addison's available or acumen to score touchdowns. He's going to be such a wonderful compliment because if there's one knock on Justin Jefferson, it's that he doesn't really he doesn't score like Moss did. Well, lo and behold, Addison is doing precisely that as a rookie, scoring almost as frequently as Moss did. So. Jordan Addison is another major reason why this brand of Vikings has remained afloat and can be for real from here on out. Then you have TJ Hawkinson. I talked about Kevin O'Connell being a you know scourge of public opinion for three or four weeks. Well, so is TJ Hawkinson. The guy wasn't hauling in contested catches like the richest tight end in NFL history should. There were a couple drops. 
And because he encountered some some of those poor games by his standard, folks, well, yeah, we overpaid for him. We shouldn't have given him that contract. You know, Quasi's trade is stupid. All of that is way too premature, knee-jerk reaction to a couple of bad plays and correspondingly, I guess, bad games by Hawkinson's lofty standards. Now, go figure, the guy's back, and he does so much more than just catch passes. Uh, he's like, uh, you know, the perfect tight end when it comes to, to run blocking, and the guy is the total package, and so even when he has those contested catches that don't go his way or he has drops that, you know, make you scratch your head. There's always more to the Hawkinson puzzle than, you know, just some big guy in the middle of the field who catches passes first downs. He's the, he's the complete deal, and he's put it all together during this winning streak, which, you know, it's those things are aligned exactly because when Justin Jefferson goes out, you can't have bullshit drops or, you know, no contested catches. You have to have the richest tight end in the sport step up, and he's done exactly that. So Addison is Hawkinson, Addison and Hawkinson showing up as formidable pass catchers in Justin Jefferson's uh, absence have made this team somewhat for real. Now, when I say for real, I don't think anybody really thinks they're going to go win the Super Bowl. I think that kind of died when Cousins got hurt and probably a long shot with Cousins in general. But, you know, to make noise, to get things exciting, to maybe push to the NFC Championship, there is a pathway because of all these factors I mentioned couple things I'll end the show on. I feel like we're seeing, and this is, this is a premature take, even I'll admit that I tweeted this last night, that if this continues, these wins, even against mediocre teams like the Falcons and Packers, hopefully the Saints, Broncos, and Bears, it's really cool that the Vikings are almost copying the 49ers. Now that the defense is good, the offensive line, after years of prayer, has, has good for us. Justin Jefferson's on the way back. It feels like Dobbs or Hall or Mullins and, of course, Cousins. We're getting to a point kind of like the San Francisco 49ers where it's – does it really matter who's playing quarterback? In the grand scheme, of course, it matters. But they didn't roll over and die because Josh Dobbs was the quarterback. And even Jaron Hall looked pretty good on that series before he encountered the concussion. So, and it would make sense because Quasi Dafamensa was reared in the 49ers organization. But I want you to keep track of this. I can't proclaim it as here for real. But there's a decent chance that based on Kevin O'Connell's play calling, kind of like Kyle Shanahan, Shanahan's known for just majesty as an offensive thinker, there is a chance that the Vikings are steadily climbing to that status of a team where, well, Cousins is out. That's cool. Why don't you throw in Jaron Hall? Or he gets concussion, throw in... Joshua Dobbs, we'll figure out the rest on the fly. That's what Kyle Shanahan's team habitually does. When they signed Jimmy Garoppolo, that guy never stays healthy. The one year he did stay healthy, they got to the Super Bowl, almost won the damn thing. But whether it is Brock Purdy or Josh Johnson or Trey Lance or Sam Darnold, the end result for the 49ers has been similar. Being a serious team, top five power rankings, getting into the postseason, making noise. And I want you to keep an eye on these Vikings because if they go through some sort of carousel or... Josh Dobbs starts next weekend, but then they go back to Jaron Hall or Nick Mullins gets a look. We might be on the cusp of this this Vikings team being similar to that where Kevin O'Connell is such a good schemer offensively that you need not die when Kirk Cousins goes out. You still have a, a head coach who was an offensive coordinator who was a quarterback that knows how to do the thing when adversity hits to the QB1. And finally, the schedule. I've pounded this home ever since the Vikings started off in a rotten way. The schedule, the mushy part, is here. You've seen that in the last two weeks. We didn't know if the Packers would be that bad when the season started. They're not very good. The Vikings took care of business, 24-10. to The Falcons were a decent team. The defense was pretty good. Taylor Heineke's fun for, what, about five plays per game. They won that game. Now you have the Saints, who looked somewhat meh against the Bears yesterday. The Broncos, who knows what kind of team you're going to get. The Bears again at home and then on the road to the Raiders. So there is a chance for the Vikings to continue this win streak. And, you know, by the end of the easy part of the schedule, you'd look up and think, oh, my goodness, these guys are eight and five or something like that. This was always going to be the easy part of the schedule. And they have a very apropos opportunity to stack wins right now, even without Kirk Cousins. So the Vikings got lucky that the real murderer's row part of the schedule occurred with Cousins in the saddle, and they were able to almost get to 500. Uh, well, I guess got to 500 with Cousins 
Um, and then now you get the easy part of the schedule and you have to use QB twos and QB threes. That's a, that's a good combination if you want the season to remain afloat. And there's always this nagging chance that there are strong parallels between 2017 and this season. If we had this show in 2017 when Sam Bradford's knee finally like went to hell or Dalvin Cook got hurt against the Lions, I would not sit on this program and be like, well, look, the Vikings are going to finish 13-3, and three, mark my words. I was just as apprehensive as you about Case Keenum amounting into anything. But because we've seen it in the past – or even in 2005 when Dante Culpepper got hurt, the Vikings won six games in a row with Brad Johnson. This franchise has a DNA to not roll over and die when a backup quarterback comes in. In fact, <laughs> weirdly, the, the team seems to get better when the backup quarterback comes in. 1998, Brad Johnson, he, he went out and Randall Cunningham came in. 1999, Cunningham's time was over. Jeff George came in at about, what, week five or six? The team got better. For some reason, I can't explain it. It's not quantifiable. The Vikings get better uh, often when a quarterback QB2 comes in in relief of a QB1 who's either been hurt or benched. So keep an eye on this win streak. Yesterday was a good launching pad for confidence, especially if Josh Dobbs has a full week of preparation and is nominated as the QB1. There is a chance that would have seemed farcical like uh, a month ago that this team all of a sudden can go on a win streak akin to 2017. And that's if the defense continues to do the thing. So they were dead in the water. I was I was talking about uh, Caleb Williams. We did a show about why it would be time to look at the Caleb Williams sweepstakes if they fell to one and six or so. Uh, but then they responded, and now they're five and four in the seventh seed of the postseason. Half a game back of the five seed and 1.5 games behind the Lions for the NFC North. You, you can't make it up. All right, we'll be back tomorrow. Let's see. What we got tomorrow? Uh, Josh Fry will be here on Wednesday. I'm not sure. Let's see. Wednesday for sure. Um, but we'll have about four or five episodes this week get, getting you ready for the Saints game and skull, baby. <laughs>